very happy to welcome um, John and Aubrey from Wolf Fire Games. Um, I've been following their game development blog. If you haven't seen it, it's a real work of beauty. If you haven't played their earlier game, Lugaro, it's a great game. Um, so, John and Aubrey. <laughs> right, Take it away, John. Thanks, Ido, for the introduction. So yeah, I'm going to start by giving a quick uh, overview of everything Wolfire has been doing, and then I want to leave time at the end for people to um, ask questions. So um, Wolfire got its start essentially from this character here, David Rosen, who was uh, kind of a child prodigy, and he made his first game in second grade in HyperCard, and by high school he was making his own 3D engines, and his first commercial release was this game, Lugaru, and if you haven't seen it, it's essentially a brutal physics-based ninja rabbit combat. Um, and this was all, I think he made his own physics back end, and it's done in OpenGL. Um, and it's got skeletal animations, and all the collisions matter. So if you hit a guy really hard and he falls into a rock, it does more damage than if he just hits soft snow or grass. And uh, there's some cool weapons like knives and swords and bow stabs. And, um, it was, it was, he didn't have a chance to promote it much, but it became an organic, uh, organic success and established kind of a community. Um, and after he released it, uh, he uh, wanted to work on the sequel. He had gotten some recruitment offers from big companies like Crytek, but he turned them down to go to college. While he was in college, he started working on a, another project called Lugaru 2. And he got most of the way um, through that, but just didn't really have time to finish it off. Uh, while going to school. So when he graduated, he decided he wanted to start up a team full-time, um, and he brought in Aubrey Sir, who is a very talented artist um, from 2D concepts to 3D assets. Um, and he also brought in his twin brother, Jeff, who had been uh, selling software commercially since high school as well. Um, and Jeff's kind of a web developer, but we're embedding WebKit, so Jeff can uh, essentially make web pages that turn into our GUIs for our editors and stuff. And Philip was one of the founding members also. He was uh, back up to David. Um, David. While David was working on the core engine tech, Philip helped work on the editor layer that allowed people to manipulate all the cool technologies that David was making. As, as you can see, Philip is also a wizard. Yeah, he's, he's casting a level five fireball right there. Um, <laughs> But uh, Philip's no longer with us. We tragically lost him to a uh, MIT PhD program, but he's a really awesome guy. And uh, that's me. I call myself the coffee operations officer. The, uh, the term in the biz might be a producer-esque role, but I've been trying to shoulder all the responsibility I can that it's not direct game development so the other guys can focus more on making the game. And uh, believe it or not, I started at Wolfire as a clean-shaven fellow, but I pledged not to shave my beard until we put the gameplay in, so it's been about two years, but now we're dangerously close to having some awesome combat. So, um, so we had our team assembled, um, but the big question, uh, we, there were a few, still a few things we needed to address, um, and the initial questions we had were, do we really want to make a, you know, a Ninja Rabbit sequel with five full-time dudes? And it was, you know, was going to feel nice to finish this prototype that David had started but uh, we really wanted to think about, we needed some more reasons to justify making it a full-time effort. And as we thought about it more, we realized that Ninja Rabbits offered us a way to really explore a space that hadn't been uh, covered by the main, mainstream industry. Um, we didn't really want to have to compete with them to make you know, space marines and barbarians and stuff. Um, so Ninja Rabbits was very unique territory. Ninja Rabbits are awesome. I mean that's my main interest in them, so. <laughs> um, and they also allow us to avoid the uncanny valley. When you try to portray a human, um, we knew we wanted to go for kind of a photorealistic approach. Um, but when you try to portray a human, even if you're getting more and more realistic with it, you fall, can fall into this uncanny valley where our, our minds just kind of re reject it for being very close but not perfect. So the, um, the animal characters allowed us to, to avoid that. But we still wanted them to be humanoid, because if you have just pure animal characters, you can't really do much beyond wolves trying to bite each other. You can't you can't put the the quote unquote cool moves in where, you know, players want to know what it's like to be able to run along a wall and then jump kick someone in the face, 
and you can't, if they don't have hands, they can't fight with swords and knives and bow stabs, and so. That, that question's too hard, dude. I don't get it. What's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we could have a debate, but yeah, I'm, I'm going with the one on the left. Um, and then the, using the species, um, they each have sort of different attributes they're associated with. So automatically we get a bunch of stereotypes in a sense that we can reinforce or contradict. And this is some um, initial concept illustration that Aubrey did uh, in detail, you know, showing all the different uh, creatures and kind of their unique cultures. Cats are pretty fancy. This guy, this guy is really cool looking. One of the uh, upper, in the, the upper echelons of overgrowth society. Um, then we had to come up with a name for it. We thought about using Lugaru again, but it's kind of a derivative, it's a derivative of a, the French word for werewolf, and we knew people weren't really going to know how to spell it offhand, and um, overgrowth ended up having a lot of meanings. It's kind of Malthusian, it literally refers to vegetation, which uh, is very in line with the, uh, the setting, so we decided it was, it was better to uh, change it to overgrowth, and it was really fun to watch it climb up on Google searches above the bacterial infections or the and babies with uh, giant heads. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and we also had to think about whether we wanted to homebrew our own engine or uh, license an existing one and two years ago there weren't a ton of options I think unity was around but pretty primitive and the unreal uh, offer to Indies was not on the table um, and David had already been making engines in high school, and so we knew if, if, if he homebrewed one, he would know exactly how it would work, and you know, he could make all the tools that he needed, and um, we could also then end up bundling those tools with the game and getting them out to the community, um, because Lugaru had like five total conversions with even like pretty terrible mod support, so we wanted to really do justice uh, by the community and make sure we got them um, tools directly with the game. And then there was the final question, Committing to uh, our own IP and our own engine is kind of a, a very risky, I guess. And we knew we were going to be pretty tech heavy with development, but we had to think about you know what what kind of PR strategy would lend itself to this kind of development style. And you know the reality is right that with your own engine, your own IP, nobody knows you exist. You're this little teeny tiny speck in a noisy, crowded space. And so we didn't want to spend all this time making a game and then end up with nobody knowing that we existed, just kind of isolated in our own little space. So we came up with this idea of open development, and that essentially allowed us to turn the, the development itself into uh, the PR. And this is an early illustration of some of the technology. I have to admit, when I first got on the project, I was like, oh, I want to make some cool openers. Yeah, Aubrey's responsible for that opener. And we should use it more. <laughs> but so the traditional framework would be, well, if you only have a sphere in your engine, you don't really want to brag about that and show that off to everyone. Um, wait until you have some actual ninja rabbits and then start blogging about what you're doing. But just the opposite, we showed the, the whole transition from day one before we even had any parts of the game to, you know, incremental steps all the way along. There's the feet got added. Uh, I'll skip to the back. <laughs> so you really get to see the whole procedural animation process there. Oh, that, we got some textures there. That was a sweet, sweet. And one thing that happened is this guy uh, took on a personality of his own. Even though he's not a ninja rabbit, he began to be called uh, Rabot by the community. And it was kind of a, you know, just organically cool experience. This is one of our most successful videos on game trailers for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty minimalistic, but it was still early technology that we could show off and that we, that we did and got more people aware of us. And then, uh, just as David did that with technology, Aubrey was very open with his art development processes as well. Um, and some of our best videos are actually time lapses of Aubrey's concept art.
I can draw really fast. <laughs> it's not actually a time lapse. <laughs> Uh, and then later on, as we had more to show, we layered on, you know, we could just continually brag about features. Now we've got Ninja Rabbits in the engine. So this is the wall running video. What the hell is this? Can we cut to the next, um, next, yeah. Warning, the animations you are about to see are early placeholders created for the purpose of visualizing the basic movement gameplay mechanics we've implemented in Overgrowth so far. They are not in any way representative of Overgrowth's quality as a final product. In editor mode, let's load a block and let's scale that block into a fatty wall. We'll press 8 to send in Robert. And you can see that if we jump up the wall, Robert runs up the wall. If we jump along the wall, Robert runs along the wall. So it's been a, a real, you know, uh, effort, but every time, you know, incrementally, we've shown every, every step of the way from uh, Rabots to Rabbits. And uh, other things we've been trying are writing op-eds, and this was probably the most successful blog post we've had. It was uh, uh, on the front page of Dig for 24 hours, just organically, um, and it was about why you should use OpenGL and not DirectX, something we, David feels very strongly about and had researched really well, um, but it's also a spicy topic. And uh, Aubrey has put a lot of effort into making the Overgrowth comic, which has been a really fun way to explore the Overgrowth space uh, early and give people, you know, a uh, better look at, at how the, the species interact and uh, how their cultures function. Um, so that's been really fun. I uh, created the comic book also as a, just a way to practice writing. Um, we're going to have to write the story for the game at some point. We, haven't, we have a lot of ideas, but uh, you know, David and I don't really feel confident in our writing ability yet. So um, in order to practice uh, just the writing aspect of game development, I thought, well, maybe we can make this comic and, and you know, try to build those skills up a little bit. And another thing uh, David did uh, was design tours, which were almost reviews of sorts of his uh, favorite indie games, but he didn't really put a score in the, in the videos. He just broke down into pieces what he really liked and, and what he thought could be improved about uh, each game's you know, design and, and gameplay and uh, technology, and they were organically successful and, and got people's attention early on in our development process. Um, and other things, we think it's really important to try to reach out to other developers, um, and it's, FaceTime is always better than uh, exchanging emails or, or Skyping, so uh, we recommend wherever, wherever you are as an indie developer, Try to connect with your the people in your area. There's got to be no. It doesn't matter where you are. There's got to be indies in your area um, that you should be you know connecting with, and definitely go to the conferences and meet people and all that. Um, and then the final pillar, uh, making noise, making friends, and and building a community, are kind of the three major uh, tasks that open development helps with. And communication with your your community really uh, really fosters a sense of um, I guess camaraderie, and it, most people think that they can just beam information out to the world and um, don't want to hear what the community has to say back, but we maintain public IR, a public IRC channel, live chats on our site, we're always looking at blog comments, and we're pretty easy to reach, and we've gotten a lot of good feedback and uh, perspectives on what we're doing from, from everyone, and I think it just makes the community a little stronger. Um, and our community has helped us we have a program called Overt Ops where if you help us uh, translate some of our assets into foreign languages, we'll give you a free copy of the game. And we've had our fact sheet translated into over 20 languages. Um, and then the final, final major thing you should do as a developer to reach out to your community is, is get them those modding tools. This was a house that one of, uh, Nimai, one of our fans, made for David early on in the process in the engine. And uh, we've, we've had other modding projects going on too. And this is all before we've got the gameplay in. It's almost like the, the editor tools are their own interesting game by themselves as a sandbox. So the way we like to uh, 
explain open development is what's more interesting to look at, the final static finished piece of art or the time lapse showing the creation of that art from the first few strokes to the you know, final shading and lighting. And if you can see the appeal of the time lapse, you can see the appeal of, of open development, explaining your development process from day one and uh, letting people know what you're thinking about and doing along the way. And it's been helpful for us. Uh, like I said, it's fostered a, a community. Our blog's subscribership has uh, sl steadily gone up. Um, and the last thing we've been trying is, uh, well, we, we, we follow the blogosphere a lot. And we noticed that game promotions tend to, especially Steam promotions, float on Reddit uh, as you know, a top hit in gaming news a lot of the time. And we were wondering um, if we might be able to do that on our own. And um, I mean, Steam's really awesome. They have 25 million active users. Introversion just declared that uh, Steam saved them financially from ruin. Uh, but they're a big company, and they're kind of busy. And we decided maybe, maybe, maybe we could take the initiative and do our own promotions. So this is the first major promotion we did with Overgrowth. Uh, and it's called the Organic Indie Pre-Order Pack. So uh, the pack was pretty successful. I had dared that if we, the pack broke a thousand sales that I would dye my beard pink, and that ended up happening. And uh, it was kind of a fun community. It's not photoshopped. Yeah. It was really that pink. The flash kind of lit it up a little bit extra, but it, it really was that pink. Um, and then the final, mo more recent promotion we've done was something called the Humble Indie Bundle. And that was with our older Ninja Rabbit fighter, Lou Garou and I'll play that video. Five classic indie games with a combined retail value of $80 are about to do something absolutely insane. Introducing the Humble Indie Bundle. It's pay what you want, so please be nice. Remember us indies when you name your price. The games are all DRM free, compatible with Mac, Linux, and PC. No corporate middleman is taking a fee, and buying the bundle helps charity. World of Goo. Aquaria. Gish. That's quite a treasure you have there in that humble bundle. Lugaru HD. Penumbra Overture. And remember that as you purchase these, you're helping our two favorite charities, Child's Play. The Electronic Frontier Foundation. So what are you waiting for? Head over to the site here. There are some pointers. Um, but yeah, it was kind of notable. It was a pay what you want promotion. If you tried to give less than a dollar, that, would, that little image below would show up um, asking for a little extra. And uh, there were charities involved, and you could choose any distribution you wanted among the developers and the two charities to really customize your your donation. And DRM kind of sucks, so we were made sure not to involve that at all. Um, and again, it was something we just did on our own. Um, we were, you know, Steam, like I said, is really awesome, but they're busy, and and there's no reason why you can't take the initiative and and try to make your own promotions happen. Um, and we're from the, from the beginning, we've been big about cross-platform support. Using OpenGL helps us do that. Uh, and if you look at the sales data, we got almost 50% more revenue by uh, supporting Mac and Linux with the promotion. So, and you, you'll notice things like the Linux guys on average gave uh, almost twice as much as the Windows guys. So um, there are a lot of interesting little tidbits from the data. But um, that's kind of the, the fast, quick, and dirty overview of everything Wolfire's done so far. Like I said, we're dangerously close to a combat system. That's a sweep kick in progress right there. So I think I'm gonna have to shave off the beard soon. But um, I wanted to open it up to questions to just um, 
see what you guys are interested in hearing more about.